Someday I just want to loop that music for like two hours and see what it does to me. Am I going to leave traumatized or am I going to leave going, this is like the greatest thing ever. Um, I'm David, I'm the college and career pastor here and I'm super excited to be here. And I want to bring to you the word, but let's go to the Lord in prayer. Would you pray with me? Father God, we thank you that you are already in our midst. That before we ask and before a word is on our tongue, you know it. Before a thought is in our mind, you are there. You are with us in our conception. As we grew up, you've known everything that has happened to us and everything that we've done. And so, God, we ask that you would come and teach us this morning, that your word would lead us to new things and new life, that your blood would wash over us, and that your spirit would rejoice in our hearts to greater righteousness, to greater joy, and as Jesus promised, to life abundantly. In Jesus' name, amen. So we have a super cheerful story this morning. Right at the beginning, we're four chapters into the first book of the Bible, and we have our first murder. So good times. Um, Let me just catch you up. If you haven't read Genesis recently, this is how it starts. God creates... He says, in the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. And he keeps speaking, and when God speaks, stuff happens. Things are created. Ex nihilos is the Latin. It means out of nothing it came. He he builds this incredible world. He, every day, says, it's good. It's good. It's good. Sheep, good. Weather, good. Planets, good. Day, night, good. Builds Adam out of the dust of the ground and says he's good. But then he says something that's not good. He says, Adam shouldn't be alone. And so he makes Adam a a, a half. He says he takes a rib out of Adam. The Hebrew is actually up to somewhere between a rib and half of Adam's entire body. We're not really sure. But I'm going to make somebody who's compatible with you. And the two of them find joy and peace and beauty. And it says in Genesis that they walk with God in the cool of the evening. And just pause for a moment there. When was the last time you were in absolute perfect harmony with another human being? The weather was perfect. So it clearly wasn't in Pittsburgh. (laughs) The weather was perfect. There was no conflict between you. It even goes as far as to say that they were naked and unashamed. And then you add that God himself is walking with the two of you, just enjoying each other. That's the scene. It's stunning. It's beautiful. And God says, there's only one thing I really don't want you to do, and that's eat this one fruit tree. So, of course, what do they do? Eat the fruit. And immediately things start to fall apart. Immediately they're thrown out of the garden. Immediately there are consequences. And we're still dealing with the consequences now. So as we look at this passage, as we look at Cain and Abel, as the, who are the first children that Adam and Eve have, we get to see in it, what you'll see is it's, it's just like us. We haven't evolved. This is our story. And so let's walk through it really quickly. And then we're going to figure out what it means. So Adam makes love to Eve. They have a kid. They give birth to Cain. And she said, with the help of the Lord, I have brought forth a man. Later, she gave birth to his brother Abel. This is very strange to me because um, biblical names matter a whole lot. And so we have, we have a declaration. Cain is born, with God's help, I have brought forth a man. Another translation is, I have been given a man. And then it's almost like in parentheses, and there's Abel. Do you see that? Now Abel kept flocks, and Cain worked the soil. In the course of time, Cain brought fruit. Abel brought fat offerings, each one from their prospective fields of operation. But Cain and his offering did not, or the Lord looked on fav, on, with favor on Abel and his offering. But on Cain and his offering, he did not look with favor. So Cain was very angry and his face was downcast. 
Then the Lord said to Cain, why are you angry? Why is your face downcast? I love when the Bible does this, by the way. When it says his face was angry, his face was down, or he was angry, his face was downcast. And immediately the Lord says, why are you angry? Why is your face downcast? It's like just making sure that we're paying attention. And it says, and then Cain says this, nothing. There's no response. And so God goes on. Why, is you, why are you angry? Why is your face downcast? Cain doesn't respond. If you do what is right, will you not be accepted? If you do not do what is right, sin is crouching at your door. It desires to have you, and, but you must rule over it. So God gives Cain a warning, saying sin is right there. In other words, doing the wrong thing is right there, but it's still outside the door. It's not inside yet, it's out crouching. It wants to come in. You have to keep it out. So what does Cain do? He immediately goes, lures his brother into a field, and beats him to death. Then the Lord says to Cain, where's your brother? And he says, I don't know. Am I my brother's keeper? Now, I want to I look at questions that parents ask children really quickly. Because in the previous chapter, when Adam and Eve have just eaten the fruit, God comes to them and says this. He says, where are you? And they hid from the Lord among the trees in the garden. They'd just eaten the fruit. But the Lord God called to the man, where are you? And he answered, I heard you in the garden, and I was afraid because I was naked, so I hid. Does that, really quick, does that sound like a really weird answer to you? Is that the way you would answer that question? No. That's the way like a four or five-year-old would answer that question. Think about it. I was naked. I heard you. So that's happened. I was afraid because I was naked, and so I hid. Have you ever had a conversation with a small child where you're like, you, you confront them and you ask them what you think is a rhetorical question and they answer with everything. They, the full confession, this is what I was feeling, this is what I did about it. You know, what did you do? I picked up the doll because I was mad and I threw it at my sister. Oh, okay. <laughs> um, it's, there's an incredible innocence here. Adam hasn't had a long time in a fallen earth to get callous and to get protected and to get guarded. Um, we had an experience with this in our house. Um, we ask a lot of rhetorical questions. It's not a great parenting technique, but it happens. Um, and so at one point, Elena, my oldest daughter, who's now 23, I'm not good with time. Is that right? Yep. Okay. Um, 23, she's sitting over here. Um, at one point, she was about five years old, and she and Emily are having an argument about something, and Emily turns to her, and my wife says, who do you think you are? Which, if you've ever asked that for, of a child, you don't want an answer, right? This is not, a, this is just, you know, I want you to go and rethink your life without having me have to walk you through every step. And so she turns to her and says, who do you think you are? And Elena, tears welling up in her eyes, puts her hands on her hips and says, I am who I am, and that is a daughter of Jesus. And for my father is the king of kings. <laughs> Needless to say, we have no recollection of what the argument was about. But that resolved it 100% right there in the moment. How do you continue? Right? That's what Adam is doing here. It's the innocence of a full confession. Contrast that with God going to Cain. We've had years now. Cain has now grown up in a fallen earth. He was born into a fallen earth. He was born with a sinful heart. He's now have off he's got an offering where his brother has had it accepted and he's had his rejected. So he's angry. This is essential to survive in our modern culture. Um, we need, by the way, a definition of anger. If I asked you, what is anger, can you define it in a sentence? I'm going to give you one that I have found the most useful. Anger is our response to perceived injustice. 
Let me say that again. Anger is our response to perceived injustice. I say perceived because sometimes we're wrong. But anger is when we see that thing that's wrong. And we suddenly have a blood pressure go up. Our adrenaline response goes up. Your muscles get stronger. You become braver. And guess what? That is a gift from God. Because what that enables us to do is to be strong enough to go and right the injustice. Anger is a gift from God. It's our response to injustice. So every time you hear somebody say, there is no God and I'm angry, the, it doesn't make any sense. Because injustice is all defined by some right and wrong that has to be solid. So Cain here is angry. Is he angry correctly or not? That's what God is trying to find out. So God comes to him and says, Cain, why are you angry? Why is your face downcast? Cain doesn't answer. So God said, if you do what is right, you will be accepted. If you do not do what is right, sin is crouching at your door. It desires to have you. You must rule over it. And again, it's still outside. Cain is being tempted. He's tempted by his own anger. But look at the situation. Cain has an offering. Abel has an offering. Abel's offering is accepted. Cain's offering is not. Who is wronging Cain? Is it Abel? It's not Abel. But Cain takes all of his anger and he gets angry at his brother. Who's wronging Cain? Well, in Cain's eyes, God is wronging him. But Cain's Hopefully, we don't know for sure, but hopefully smart enough to realize fighting with God's not going to work out so well, so I'm going to get mad at this guy over here. I'm going to be jealous of him, and I'm going to fight with him, and I'm going to contend with him, and I'm going to take it out on him. But Abel doesn't have any more capacity to have his offerings accepted than Cain does. So in other words, Cain takes a problem which is here with him and God, And he projects it onto his brother and says, this guy's got to go. Here's his problem. There's his solution. And God even warns him. He says, sin is crouching at your door. Don't let it in. Don't do this thing. God, of course, is outside of time, outside of space. He knows exactly what's going to happen. It's not like God is figuring this out at the same time that Cain is. God is outside and warning him, hey, you need to control this. Otherwise, that sin that's outside your door is going to come inside and you're going to do something. Cain takes his brother out. Cain kills him. The Lord comes to Cain again and says, where is your brother Abel? Listen to Cain's response. I don't know, he replied. Am I my brother's keeper? So at this point, instead of just stonewalling the Lord and not saying anything, he's actually going so far as to say, I don't know, straight up lie. And am I my brother's keeper? It's not even my responsibility to know. So I want to pause and talk about families for just a minute. Um, So you were born in this thing that you can't control. There's one decision in a family And everything else is automatic. A husband and a wife, in our culture, since we don't generally have arranged marriages, choose to get married. They sometimes, speaking from experience, choose to have children. Sometimes the children are an accident and arrive unexpected. Um, You don't choose to have parents. You don't choose to have aunts, uncles. All those, there's all this, this whole web of relationships which you were just born into, which is the people that have the most influence on your life. They're the ones that raise you or not raise you. They're the ones that love you or not love you. They're the ones that teach you or not teach you. It's both the action and the inaction, but these are the most significant people in your life, and there's nothing we can do about it. We can't pick our families any more than you all could pick being born in the 20th century. There might be some born in the 21st century here. But 
th- th- we're, we're, this is, okay, here we are. What do we do with it? Here's the thing, though, is that because of the power that our families have, that means that our response is equally as great. Our anger, our pain, our frustration, our joy, our comfort, all of those things are in relationship to how important and how powerful the family is. And so if we look at ourselves and we say, okay, this is my response to my family. This is my response to the fact that my brother's gifts are accepted and mine are not. Or whatever the situation that you find yourself in. The reason that you're having a strong response overall to family is because it's powerful. And we don't like things that have power over us that we can't control. Let me say that again. We don't like things that have power over us that we can't control. So Cain kills his brother. Where is your brother, says the Lord? I don't know, he replies. Am I my brother keeper? My brother's keeper. And the Lord said, what have you done? Listen, your brother's blood cries out to me from the ground. Now you are under a curse and driven from the ground. And then it goes on for quite, quite a lot. of. Okay, you were already thrown out of the garden. Now you have to leave this area too. But do you hear what happens? Your brother's blood, he says to Cain, is crying out to me from the ground. Crying out to me from the ground. Um, there are those of you, and I know this is, it's hard to talk about. And I, it's hard to talk about because it's so powerful. Those of those of you who have experienced incredibly terrible things from your families, who have, extre- have extreme heartache. And there's a, part, there's, a, there's a response that we have to it to try to deal with this. And one option is that we make our family everything. We make it the thing that's going to save us or define us or rescue us or whatever that is. We make it our God. And the other option is we take it and we shove it way, way down and we say, this doesn't matter to me. These people, whatever, I'm moving on. And we ignore it and we make it nothing. Now, I know that there's a few of you that have a beautiful family and I love that, but most of us are in a mess a lot of the time. Most of us are in a mess a lot of the time. So I want to look at this. Adam and Eve name their children Cain and Abel. And this is really important. Cain means God has given me. It's a possession of the Lord. That's what the Hebrew for Cain means. The Hebrew of Abel means nothing, a whiff, a vapor, a breath. Pastor Craig introduced us to Ecclesiastes, which we're actually going to look at another passage in a minute, last week. And and Ecclesiastes starts off with this verse. It says, vanity, vanity of vanities, all is vanity. That's the same root word in the Hebrew as the name Abel. How would you like to be named nothing? Vapor. While your brother was named a possession of the Lord, a gift from the Lord. And the interesting thing is, if you go back a chapter, we find out why. So Adam and Eve get kicked out of the garden, and God says three different things on their way out. First, he addresses the snake, who is the one who tempted Eve into sinning and broke up this perfect world. Then he addresses Eve, and then he addresses Adam. But listen to what he says to the snake, and Eve is listening to this. Cursed are you above all the livestock and all the wild animals. You will crawl on your belly belly, and you will eat dust all the days of your life. And I will put enmity between you and the woman and between your offspring and hers. And he will crush your head and you will strike his heel. So Eve is listening to this and she hears, my offspring will crush the head of the serpent and all of this mess will get restored and we can go back to the garden the way it was. Who does she think her offspring is? Her firstborn, Cain. 
Now, we know because we've read the next several hundred pages that what that is is even in the garden as they're being shoved out, God is saying Jesus is coming. The descendant of Eve will come and drive out the serpent and crush him. And we heard Marcus read from Revelation where it says that he comes drip, dipped with white robes that are dipped in the blood of his enemies. There is justice coming. But Eve put her hope in the wrong guy. So she puts it in Cain. God has finally given me this offspring. We can fix all of this. It's all going to be okay. Do you see this? She's just lifted her family up and said, this is everything. This is my salvation. Then another kid is born, and she says, no, no, no. This is a whiff of dust. This is nothing. He's, he's, he's vapor. So Cain has been raised as the, the, the savior. And so when God rejects his offering, he has no idea what to do. He has no idea what to do. And so he gets enraged and he gets hurt and he goes after his brother who is in no way responsible here. Scripture says that when we fight, our battle is not against flesh and blood. Flesh and blood, that's our family. Our battle is not against flesh and blood. It's not against other people. It's against the powers and principalities and rulers of this dark age. So I want to talk really quickly, and I don't want to go too far into this, but I want to talk really quickly about abuse. Because abuse inside families is the number one statistic for how people get abused and the vehicle through which it comes. And it's horrible, and it's painful, and it's horrific. Um, I had, um, in our family, um, my wife's father was somebody that I didn't meet for the first 10 years we were married. It's because he was in prison for cocaine trafficking to minors and aggravated assault. But I had the opportunity of speaking with him from time to time on the phone, and one of the things that I got to do was to teach him how to be a dad, which was a weird experience. But because he couldn't contact us, only we could contact him, I got to say, hey, these are the boundaries. These are the things to talk about. When when you talk to your daughter, you should ask her about her day, ask her about her kids, ask her about her life. We don't care who killed JFK. Um, And then he got out of prison. And we tried to have a semi-relationship with him, but he he died very quickly thereafter. And I remember my wife kneeling beside his bed. And I know the stories and stories and stories of pain and abandonment and and the the awful things done to that family. And she knelt down next to his bed and she said, Dad, I forgive you. I forgive you. And then she said something that I did not say so I can talk about it. She said, I I promise that I will only tell the good stories even though there aren't that many. And so not only did she say, I forgive you for the past, but she said, this is how I'm going to act towards you and about you going forwards. And so God sets it up. And says, you have this incredibly powerful thing that will influence you. And it might influence you in beautiful, amazing ways. And it might influence you in terrible ways. And if you're like most of us, it's influenced you in both a lot. Both. So I want to show you something. In Ecclesiastes 4, chapter 1, we'll look at it together. Verse 1. It says this, again... I looked and I saw all the oppression that was taking place under the sun. I saw the tears of the oppressed. This is God talking. And they have no comforter. Power was on the side of their oppressors and they have no comforter. And at first glance, we read this and we say, um, okay, so the oppressed have no one to comfort them and the oppressors have no one to fight against them. But what it's actually saying is the oppressed have no one to comfort them 
and the oppressors have no one to comfort them. It's, God actually comes to comfort both. Otherwise, Cain would get written off. Otherwise, God would not warn Cain. Otherwise, God would not say, do, this is the right thing to do. Sin is crouching at your door. Don't let it in. And later on in this same chapter, we see that Cain is actually given a mark so nobody will harm him as he goes out into the world and is kicked even further out of the garden. And so we have God who comes and offends us because he says he's here for the abuser as well as the abused. And this is what the Pharisees and the tax collectors and the Jewish rulers were complaining about constantly with Jesus. When they said he eats with Pharisees and with sinners, I'm sorry, he eats, with ta- he eats with tax collectors and sinners. And often it's reversed. He eats with sinners and tax collectors because tax collectors were even worse. Tax collectors were people who had left their Jewish roots, abandoned their country, gone full defect, joined the Roman forces, and were now part of the oppression by taking money from the Jews and sending it to the Romans. And then on top of that, they were known for stealing a huge amount of money from the Jews in order to feed their own desires. And Jesus calls people like Zacchaeus and says, Tonight, today, salvation has come to your house and the people lose their minds. Why? Because he came for the oppressors. He came for the oppressed. So Jesus is hanging on the cross. In Luke 23, it says this, when they came to the place of, called the skull, they crucified him here. This is Jesus. Along with the criminals, one on his right and the other on his left. Jesus said, Father, forgive them. They do not know what they are doing. And they divided up his clothes by casting lots. Now, I've, I've been reading this for years and I see Jesus say, they don't know what they're doing. And it suddenly struck me in the last couple of weeks. I was like, wait, 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 wait. They absolutely knew what they were doing. They've been trying to kill him for years. That involved multiple levels of government. They send him to Herod. They send him to, um, to Pilate. Pilate had been warned in a dream through his wife, don't have anything to do with this guy, and he still does it. The Romans had worked out the most effective way you could possibly torture and kill a human body. Crucifixion is the worst way to die that has ever been invented, and they did it systematically in order to come up with this way of, doing, of killing people. So when Jesus says, forgive them, they don't know what they're doing, he can't be talking about the plotting because they've been plotting. The Jews have been plotting. The Romans are in on it. So what does he mean? What he means is at the end of the age, when all of the things that are hidden become suddenly revealed, when the Lord comes back and they understand they will look and say, oh my God, what were we doing? Oh my God, what, what did I do? And Jesus was the recipient of that, that abuse, that torture, that death. And he hung on the cross and he said, forgive them, they don't know what they're doing. And we are invited to carry the cross of Christ. We are carry, we, he kept saying to his disciples, come, follow me. And he meant not just to the crucifixion, but through it to the other side. And so we're being invited constantly, come, follow me. But it's not come, follow me, because I'm up in heaven looking at you down there as you're suffering. It's Jesus who's in the midst of the suffering. It says that he has experienced everything as we have. Every temptation, every abandonment, every pain. And he says, forgive them, they don't know what they're doing. And so I want to talk to you really quickly. If you're somebody who has hurt other people, especially the people in your family, the Lord is calling you to repent. Repent means to make an about face. To say, yes, I did that. 
When he comes to you and says, why are you hiding like he did with Adam? You just say, this is how I felt. And this is what I did. And the blood of Jesus covers that. I'm going to look with you at Hebrews chapter 12, 24. Abel's name is mentioned four times in the New Testament. This is in Hebrews. It says, you have come to Jesus the one who mediates the new covenant between God and people and to the sprinkled blood, sprinkled blood of Christ, which speaks of forgiveness instead of crying out for vengeance like the blood of Abel. Instead of crying out for vengeance, the blood of Jesus says vengeance has already taken place. The innocent one, the son of God, the very perfect of most perfect beings was crucified, the worst death you can die, so that our sin isn't held against us. But there's a warning in this, and that's this. If you want to experience something really painful in your family, this is one of the weirdest and, 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 and very hurtful things, is when somebody who has really hurt you repents if you haven't already forgiven them. Let me say that again. It's extremely painful when someone in your family repents either to you or to the Lord and you haven't already forgiven them. And what Jesus does on the cross is he says, forgive them. They don't know what they're doing. And he invites us to say the same thing. And it's not just Jesus, by the way. Stephen says the same thing in Acts chapter 7. As he's being stoned, he looks up and he sees Christ standing at the right hand of the Father and then he says in a loud voice, forgive them, Lord, and dies. So we know it's not just Jesus that says that, but that's our response as well. And so if you're someone who has hurt somebody else, the response is to say, God, I'm sorry. Forgive me. And if you're somebody who has been reci the recipient of that hurt, the Lord wants you to say, I forgive you. And I recognize that you don't truly know what you are doing. So here's the challenge is that we have had decades of history to dig through in order to figure out what we're supposed to forgive or repent of. And that's where the beauty of Jesus' presence in this room comes in. What God does and what God is going to do with you this morning is this. He's going to come to you and he's going to say this one thing. This story, this memory, is the one I want to talk about. This is the one where sin is crouching at your door. Don't let it in. Offer forgiveness. Seek repentance. And he's going to come to you, and he's actually going to pick out a memory of yours. And just so you know, um, the enemy, the snake, Satan, loves to talk about power but he doesn't have any, none. He's a created being just like we are. He's an angel who has fallen. He's not God. There's no yin and yang. There's no balance of light and dark. There is God in all authority over all of heaven and over all of earth. And what he says is the only thing that matters in the entire history of the universe. And then there's Satan who tries to get us, who just nags at us. And so when you're sitting in with the Lord and you say, God, would you show me what you want me to see? Would you show me where I am? Would you show me who I am? Would you show me my story? What do you want to talk about? Know that Satan cannot muscle into the middle of that and whatever weird thought you have, take it seriously. Here's the weird thought I had yesterday afternoon. I was standing on this stage preparing, reading through the scriptures, praying, and nagging in the back of my mind is, um, it was a chair that I promised my mom I would recover. And I, there were four chairs. I did three of them. Now, the awkward thing is, is that I did three of them 25 years ago. 25 years ago. When I was in college, or maybe it was longer, I might have been high school, I don't even remember like, when I was working on it, I was like, this looks vaguely familiar, but I don't even remember this job. But I came across this chair a couple weeks ago at my parents' house, and I was like, wait, I thought I fixed these, and there was one left. 
And so in order to even prepare to come and preach to you today, I had to go to my mom and say, I'm sorry, I owe you a chair and fix it. And so we hung out in the, in the, in the kitchen and I fixed the chair. And I, I didn't do a great job. I'm not good with that sort of thing, but it's done. <laughs> and she was pleased. So um, take every thought captive is what the scripture says. Take every thought captive. And you might have to go this week and repent to somebody And it might be monstrous and huge and a big deal. And it might be effortless and silly and you end up laughing about it while you're fixing a chair in the kitchen. But we're going to ask God to come. I'm going to ask Pastor Brad to come out and then I'm going to ask him to sing one of my favorite songs. It's just two two verses. And I'm going to ask you to bow your head. And Father God, we ask you to come. And we know you've been here, Lord. My sense is that you've been nagging at people this whole time with, I hope I don't have to talk about that. But Lord, you are gentle and you are kind. You say, come to me, all you who are tired and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. My burden is easy and my yoke is light. And so would you come, Lord, and search us the way you do with David in Psalm 139. When he says, show me my anxious thoughts. If there's any wrong way inside me, reveal it, Lord. And so, God, would you come and walk amongst us? You know our stories. You know our lives. You know the things that we've done. You know the things we've done to others. Come, Lord, what do you want to address? So Lord, regardless of how we feel about this scene that you've brought up, about what's in our minds right now, we want our relationship with you to be restored to its fullness so that we can walk with you in the cool of the evening, so that we can be naked and unashamed, so that when you ask us questions, we can bear our full heart our motivations, our feelings, our actions. That we can be intimate with you, Lord. The way that you, Lord, are intimate, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. And you've invited us over and over into that. So we pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen.